You're listening to a CNA podcast. So hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Deep Dive with Crispina, Robert and me, Stephen Chia. It's a special one today because if you were out and about the city and unfortunately at the airport last Friday, you might have found yourself at the airport for far longer than you expected to be. We're talking about the big IT outage that went out all, pretty much across the world, right Crispy? Yeah, as far as IT outages go, this was big. A contact who's been in technology reporting for more than 20 years said he was still wrapping his head around what was going on. All he could text me was... Was, okay, this is big. How bad? Airlines, financial services, media companies, hospitals, cafes, supermarkets. I mean, pretty much a whole bunch of people had that dreaded blue screen of death. Of course, yes. it messed up a whole lot of uh, logistics all across the world. People couldn't pay for stuff, couldn't get about. In, in fact, I think they were manually writing out boarding passes as well. That's how bad it got. Okay, so if you're low tech like me, you want to stick around because we have a lot of questions. And like, how would a routine software update? You know, the kinds we got all the time, Steve, in our computers. Without quite thinking twice, we just click update, right? Exactly, right? And how did it become a full-blown crisis? Joining us online are Gaurav Kirthi. He's Head of Advisory and Emerging Business at Ensign Info Security. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. And Benjamin Ang, Head Center of Excellence for National Security and Head Digital Impact Research at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. Hi, Crispina and hi, Stephen. Thanks for having me on board. Okay, so welcome, gentlemen. I mean, a whole bunch of our listeners are probably old enough to remember the whole Y2K thing. We were really afraid crossing into the year 2000 because we didn't know how how it would affect all our computers and our systems. Now it's almost 25 years later. Is this in any way similar, Gaurav? There are some similarities, but there's also some differences. So if we rewind back to the Y2K bug, basically all computers rely on some form of instructions and those instructions are converted into software and that's what tells them what to do. Back in the Mm. Y2K bug era, dates were stored as two-digit numbers and not four-digit numbers. So when you move from the year 1999 to the year 2000, some computers thought that you were going back in time to 1900. So they crashed. In some ways, that's similar to what happened recently. There was some errors in the instructions that were being sent out to the computers. The computers didn't know how to process that instruction, and so they crashed. So that's what's similar. But what's different? What's different is that in 1999, even though digital was already a thing, today it's a lifestyle. It's part of everything we do from the supermarket to the airport to just generally Mm. connecting with our friends and loved ones. So it is a much more pervasive part of our life, which is why when something goes down, the impact is much more tangible to all of us. And I've got another reason why it's different which is that I remember because I was actually managing enterprise IT, uh, corporate IT, you know, in 1999. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Not revealing age at all. (laughs) um, Declaring my age. Yeah, just before it's okay. You know, I have no illusions. No, you think I'm... You look young. young It's okay, Ben. It's okay. Oh, thank you. You Yeah, it's fine. (laughs) But see, leading up to Y2K, we were preparing. We were getting ready for it. We were spending tons of money, Mm -hmm. right? trying to fix the problem before it happened, which is why Y2K did not become a global disaster. Mm. Right? I remember staying up on a conference call. Right. In those days, conference call, we used phones, right? <laughs> we didn't have Zoom. And, then, and waiting for New Zealand to turn on to 2000 <laughs> and to see whether they would suddenly right. disappear <laughs> off the call, right? But now we are not prepared because we don't even know. And, and mm. the continuity plans we had, business continuity plans, like BCPs in those days, you could say, oh, we will back up the entire office into a bunch of tapes, right. remember, tapes. And then we can keep them in a secure box somewhere. But now there's so much data. How do you back up your corporate data right now? You back it up to another cloud, but then the other cloud is also, yeah. But in the last 25 years, we have become so much smarter. Our systems have become so much smarter, right? So how can one update cause the entire... So the why is just as important, I feel, right? Gaurav, what do, you, what do you think? Well, first, to get a sense of scale, on a very numerical kind of the data basis, the whole internet did not go down. So Microsoft reported that you know less than 1% of the computers were affected. But because many of these computers served other computers that served other computers that served other people, the kind of ripple effects of just that small yeah. number right. was much more significant. Okay, okay. Wait, so let's yeah. break it down again. So if we had to list out what happened in a chronological order, basically, as a user, I have no idea, but you're telling for a company who's using a Windows or Microsoft operating system. Okay, take it from there. What happened next? 
Generally, what happens is that uh, software that all of us use uh, has an update cycle. Sometimes when they find a problem or they find a new feature they want to add, they push out a patch and an update. That update gets sent to the computer. Uh, that update then gets installed and then the new software runs. Yep. In this particular case, an update was sent out and instead of giving new features or new security, it crashed that computer. So it was like a bad bug, like a food poisoning bug. You could say that. You could say that. It's slightly more contagious though. Uh, okay. Uh, food poisoning affects a smaller number. Right. But you're right. It essentially was something that spread out. And this bad bug came from a third party company. Is that right? Because they are responsible for all the cybersecurity that Microsoft handles, is that correct? So if you step away from the specific and you think about the more general point, um, all vendors have patching policies and all software have updates. Uh, in this particular case, you're right that this was a particular vendor that was providing that type of software. But actually, more broadly, all of the software we use has updates. Right. And any one of those updates, if it's not managed in a way that ensures that it's deployable or safe to deploy and use, uh, could cause an incident like this. The broader point is really these types of incidents will continue to happen because we just operate in such an interconnected ecosystem. In the professional world, we have a term called supply chain risks. And understanding your supply chain means understanding what is the software that you rely on to deliver your business function, but also what is the software that your software relies on to deliver their business function, and what is the software that that software relies on. So Ben, you want to add to this? Yeah, this really is the worldwide version of what happened to us with the DBS and Citibank outages. It wasn't the banks that went down. Bank IT is very strong. But what went down was a data center. And what the data center went down because the cooling mm. didn't work. Right. So the data center went down. And the problem, as Gaurav was talking about, is we're so interconnected that yeah. if you were a DBS customer and you said, you know what, I'll have my backup. Don't worry. If DBS ever has a problem, I'll use Citibank instead. Well, guess what? They all lead back to the same data center. Which brings us to that question of the reliance, you know. So in, yeah. in a way, to for half the world to stop because of one company, one would then ask, oh my gosh, <laughs> there are too many eggs in the same basket, right? So should we not be diversified? Are, are not these companies like Microsoft having many vendors to support each different area so that something like that does not happen? I know it feels like half the internet went down, but actually it was just a, a very limited number of systems. But they were all supporting largely the airline industry, I mean... I think the airline industry was, was most uh, visibly hit because it performs almost an essential service of getting people onto their flight and when their backups, it's significant. Please correct us if we're wrong, Gaurav, but according to some of the reports that we've been reading, Microsoft and CrowdStrike controls quite a, quite a big market when it comes to this security. In fact, CrowdStrike doubled its market cap in the last 12 months. It's like 83 billion US dollars and was only launched in 2012 and did so well that it was used by 298 of Fortune 500 companies. This includes banks, your healthcare companies, etc. So our question is, are we not spreading the risk a lot more? Or is there just only a few players here? I mean, this goes back to that whole thing about supply chain risks. And I think Ben and I have had many conversations uh, both between each other as well as on panels about this issue of supply chain. You're right that diversification is a great strategy. It's not always mm -hmm. a possible strategy. In this particular case, I mean, these are both great vendors. Uh, they, they make brilliant software, which generally works. And it was one incident. But it could happen to any other company as well. And I think trying to say that diversification will solve the problem, it may reduce the impact. And it's something that I want to talk about later on as well. When you think about resilience, understanding the operational impact is important. But it won't prevent it from happening. So why is diversification an issue, Ben? Is it not as easy as we think it is? Yeah, absolutely right, Crispina. And so Gaurav was saying, right, you, you want to have diversification, but seriously, you know, when I was running corporate IT, you can't have half of the company working with one operating system <laughs> yeah. and the other half working the other. <laughs> with one right? already, it, there's so many yeah, problems. <laughs> yeah, it's hard enough with one. Can you imagine if your cybersecurity is being managed by two different systems? Mm. Okay. Then you have this problem that one will think that the other one is an intruder and try to cancel each other out. <laughs> or they will both be like, oh, you think that both are working and there's one right. invader that goes in between them. Fair enough. That makes sense. But there is a way that diversification can help. And this is in the form of what we call business continuity plans. So rather than making your entire business process 
only work if all of the systems are perfectly functional, have a degraded mode. Have a backup plan where you can still deliver the function. Maybe, yes, it's a handwritten boarding pass and it, you know, it doesn't feel as fancy as the ones that they print out. <laughs> but does the passenger still get to the flight? Yes. Does the luggage right. still get on board? Yes. So having those ideas and options of not diversifying necessarily the technical solutions, but diversifying uh-huh. your business process, I think is incredibly important. And this is really where thinking about resilience, thinking about preventive measures yeah. really helps a lot. I, I, I think, yeah, everyone w- will agree with you on that. But we also have to ask that from the technical point of view, did this also happen because there weren't enough checks in place? Yes, okay, we all work off one system, but therefore we have to ensure even more that that system is working well or whatever goes into the system is done in a way that does not allow things like that to happen. Was something missing in this case, Ben? You know, th- there are a lot of theories that quality assurance, the QA, wasn't tight enough for this particular one. But also in perspective, there are thousands of these going out every day, every week, every month. And... So far, 99.9% of the time, it doesn't cause outages. Mm. So one out of all of this, it's bad. But is it acceptable? Is that what you're saying? I think we need to think around the other thing. that Because it's it's going to happen again. Just by the sheer number and the sheer connectivity, we're going to have that the need to have that resilience. And as much as people make fun of the handwritten boarding pass, that's actually very resilient that they actually can do it. Think of all the power stations which were hacked in the Eastern okay. Europe and they were able to reset them by physically pressing something. Okay, I just wanted to follow up with you, Ben, on that point you were making about the written out boarding pass, right? So one of the big questions our listeners asked was, why isn't there some sort of proper backup for airlines, for example? Why is it that only when something like this happens, when the thing goes on a blink and then everybody's scrambling to figure out how do we do this? How do we get people on the plane? There were people who missed their flights, right? So do you think this kind of like high key businesses really need to double down on an alternative? It would be good to have things like resilience drills, like we have fire drills, emergency drills so that we practice it. And that will help. Uh, and also realize that we are actually functioning in a world that is way faster than human beings are able to do. That's, That's the wonder true. of having technology. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How fast can you ride out a boarding pass, right? I know we make fun of the manual boarding passes. I'm not a big fan of the manual uh, workaround right. either. I think you're right there. It could be digital systems in place to take over. But you also have to accept that mm. these take time to kick in. This is what we call a failover process. If your primary system fails, what's your backup plan? And sometimes it takes maybe half an hour, an hour, or two hours to set up. If your car breaks down on the way to office, you can still get to office, but you will be late. Right. You know, maybe it's 10 minutes late, maybe it's half an hour late, whether you take a taxi or a bus, but you will get to office. Even in the airport case, it did take a little bit of time. It was one to two hours, mm-hmm. but very quickly things yeah. got back. And there was a transition period where some people were unfortunate and missed their flight. But I think if you step back and look at the wider ecosystem, you know, the light stayed on, the phone still worked, hospitals yeah. were still functioning. So everything else in Singapore actually worked as planned, mm. despite this affecting many other countries. And I do personally believe that it's largely because over the last few years, I think we had this debate in Parliament very recently, the Cybersecurity Act has put in place all of the requirements for essential services, as you put it, Crispina, to be prepared for something like this to happen. And that's exactly what companies need to do. They need to be prepared that something like this will happen again and again. So in that sense, then, are we saying that we should expect tech to break down? Because right now, there's so much reliance. And for you guys, were you actually surprised when this happened? Or were you just thinking, oh yeah, we should have expected it? I wouldn't say I expected this exact incident to happen. But I expect these types of incidents to happen all the time. And in fact, um, one of the things that we tell companies to do is to have exercises, as Ben called it, you know, resilience drills. Mm. Think of the unthinkable. Uh, And just by coincidence, one of the companies that we worked with just a few months ago we had this exact scenario. A software update comes in and crashes all of your computers. What are you going to do? 
the clock starts now. And if companies start thinking along those lines and rehearsing and planning for all of the contingencies that could or might happen, actually they're in a better place to go into that failover mode to make sure that they either have a drawer full of manual boarding passes right next to where the agent is sitting, or they have a separate printer and a separate laptop ready to print out those boarding passes. So you start thinking along those lines about how do you manage a crisis like this? Because you can't predict which system is going to fail. Yeah. Maybe it'll be the check-in system, maybe it'll be the luggage system, maybe it'll be something else, but you can prepare how you respond to that crisis. I just want to pick up about these drills, lab, basically. I, I find that, especially when traveling in airports now, I'm sure you guys have this experience too, um, where you can just, you know, b- basically breeze in. There's no human involved in this equation. Yeah. In fact, they've taken out so many immigration counters and replaced them with machines, right? So the old-fashioned way would be to get boots on the ground to move people out. And that's also not possible in a crunch situation like this, isn't it? So Why can't we get boots on the ground? If we know that it, you know they are in standby mode, these guys are on recall, you just activate them, it takes an hour for them to come down, and then you get the system going again, right? Ben, do you think that's realistic? Yeah, in Singapore's case, in the meantime, you go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> because you have Jewel right it's, next to it. <laughs> yes, you have Jewel. Okay, but you can't pay for stuff because like... you only have a credit card. <laughs> exactly. In my mind, it sounds like a good idea to have a completely, you know, a good system, backup system, but it just feels like it's hard to do. It involves money, it, it involves people. It it is a completely, you know, different system. Maybe even not Windows have a Mac system running separately. Oh, that's... That's a whole different discussion now, right? <laughs> the Linux people were actually exactly, saying that, hey, yeah. we're safe. But somebody pointed out that Linux systems had a similar problem a few months ago. So oh. let us not point one finger and three fingers point back. Every system is vulnerable, right? Every system right? has problems. And, and because yeah. they're all algorithmic, they depend on instructions to be written in a very precise way. Sometimes they go wrong. Nowadays, software is built on so many libraries from so many other coders. We've seen incidents where some coder, you know, who's managing a library as a hobby, uh, does something wrong hmm. and crashes, you know, thousands of computers. Not because they're malicious. It's just it's hard to write great code. But I think going back to hmm. Christina's point about backups and activating them, these cost resources. Uh, and actually, part of the reason why many companies digitalize is so that they can reduce their costs and to pass these savings on. Uh, And having all of these backups on standby is difficult. But I will say one thing, and I think it's an important point to make, that for the essential services, particularly in Singapore, by regulation, we've forced them to make sure that they have backup plans in place. And yes, it comes with higher costs. So sometimes it's useful to have some of these incidents to remind the general public that the cost of some things are going up because people have to make all of these contingency plans. You have to have all of these systems on standby just in case. You have to have two data centers. You have to have two sources of electricity, two this, two that. Mm. And it's important, but it does cost. The other option would be to try and build totally brand new systems which would then in themselves be vulnerable. So that also doesn't make sense because some people are saying, why, you know, China's airports didn't have a problem. South Korea too. I read that South Korea and China had very limited to almost no outages. So that's interesting. Yeah, but it could have happened in China and then they would have been entirely crippled. So So it really depends on, firstly, what software you're using, the configuration of how those softwares interact. So some people who had the specific vendors, they had no problems at all. Uh, My whole company had just a handful of cases and then they resolved. So it really depends on how it works out in your environment. Okay. And that's hard to predict. Mm. Are you guys saying that our systems are robust enough. I mean, are are they pretty good already to the point that they're doing what they should be doing and then we just have to accept that these things can and will happen from time to time? Ben? This is such a hard thing to say because (laughs) what is robust enough? You know, everybody sets their own standards. Mm -hmm. But I do think also that individually, whether it's in our individual organisations or on an individual basis, Mm. we also need to have our own plans of what we do when something like this happens. If we are reliant on a larger organizational or even national plan to save us, then we are actually not building our own resilience. So for example, when if you know you're concerned about the banking online digital banking systems having failures, then make sure we have cash. I mean not a huge amount of cash under the the mattress, but at least some cash to get by for the next day or two. Right. This kind of goes back to two key messages. The first is preparation, preparedness rather, being always of the mindset that something could fail and 
spending a lot of time when everything is working fine to wonder, you know, what if this fails? What if that fails? How would my company handle it? How would my company mm. message it? How would I handle the crowd? How would I handle the public? How would I handle the messaging? So all of these are things that companies should be doing all the time when everything is working fine. Mm. Because if you only start thinking about the worst case scenarios when you're in the middle of a worst case scenario, <laughs> it is yeah. far too late. So preparation and being prepared is key to all of this. And this comes from, you know, your governance and risk and compliance. It comes from your development and security ops policy. It comes from all of the things that go into being better, more secure, but also the resilience mm -hmm. part. You know, once it happens, how often do you push that button? How often do you test whether your failovers work? How often do you test your backup mm -hmm. mode? How often do you test your staff but they know the backup mode? It's just like fire drills. Right. If you do a fire drill once a year and everybody coincidentally goes for lunch out on the one day they do the fire drill, when the fire drill <laughs> happens, will they actually know how to get out of the building? Yeah. Uh, and so sometimes it's important to don't tell people you're going to do a fire drill today, just do it. Uh, and that's the best form of training. I just want to wrap with one more question in my mind. It's a legal thing and we don't want to speculate. But some of the questions that have come up is in terms of who has to hold the bag, essentially. Like who has oversight, who has to take some responsibility. In this case, it's, as you've explained, it's complex. Do you guys think that this is also something people need to look at? Like when something like this happens, where does the buck stop? I think it's an excellent question. Uh, I don't have the answer for you, but I will say two things. One is that in Singapore, actually, we're very fortunate uh, to have a Cybersecurity Act, which has such strict powers to govern those who are delivering essential services to hold them up to a very high standard. So that's the first thing. The second thing, and the more complex question you're asking about is liability. And the question of liability is a very big question that I think bigger countries need to address first. Liability in the US is very unclear. If self-driving cars go wrong, is it the software developer's fault? Is it the car manufacturer's fault? Is it the driver's fault for not actually paying attention while sitting in a self-driving car? So all of these questions about technology and the liability are still open questions in much bigger jurisdictions. And I do think that they need to have this difficult conversation. Maybe the silver lining to this cloud is that this will catalyze that conversation about who is liable, what liability means in the tech sector, whether the blue screen of death, whether incidents that happen that cause outages are a shared responsibility framework, individual responsibility, you know, how does it work? So it's a great question to ask. I don't have the answer, but I hope more people do ask that question. Yep. Ben, do you have an answer? Well, although I used to be a lawyer, I don't practice anymore. So anything that I say now is not legal <laughs> advice, but just my opinion. With that caveat, in negligence law, the question would be, what would have been reasonable for an organization like CrowdStrike or like Microsoft to have done? Mm -hmm. What are the reasonable precautions that they could have taken according to the standards of the industry? Right. So that would be a very general kind of concept. What would be reasonable by the standards? But on a contractual basis, then what does each company's contract with Microsoft say? What does Microsoft's contract with CrowdStrike say? Mm -hmm. And what are uh, the various responsibilities on who gets to do what? Mm. So that's not an answer, but it just says it depends. It depends, yeah. It, it does depend. And I think beyond the specific vendors and companies that were involved in this particular incident, I think, Crispina, your question is a much broader almost philosophical yep. one. Mm. Almost every industry in the world is tightly regulated except tech. Mm. So I think there is a real conversation around that that will happen as a result of this. Um, if your toaster explodes, there are laws around that. If your car crashes, there are laws around that. Mm. So every sector has its form of regulatory compliance. And I, I go back to, again, Singapore, where we're very lucky that we yep. do have very tight laws around this to keep us safe. And again, even though it felt like the internet went down, for most of us on Friday, it was just you could go home a little bit earlier. Yeah. And everything else worked fine. Uh, almost everything else was pretty much seamless. Yeah, for some it was a bonus. They could go for a happy hour. Um, it's Friday. <laughs> yeah, because beer is on tap. It's manually uh, pulled, you know. <laughs> yeah, we, we should never digitize that. That's I think right. that's, a, that's an essential service. <laughs> As you've all rightly pointed out, so much of our lives are lived online, you know. It's when things like that happen, then you suddenly realise like, whoa, 
if this, you know, were to go down, if suddenly my, my telco were to shut down for whatever reason, my, would my life stop and how could I carry on living, you know? So thinking of alternatives and, and sort of managing our expectations. But uh, it has been good in that sense that this has been a bit of a wake-up call. Uh, unfortunate for those who had to suffer the consequences, but hopefully we continue to involve and I guess get better with time, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's having the mindset to say, I need to think of the what if of what ifs yeah. yeah exactly thank you thank you gentlemen yeah. for coming no, by I... and explaining to us ironically we're doing this online as well <laughs> not face to face and we've seen how reliable that yeah, is yeah, that... exactly right <laughs> <laughs> alright guys thanks so much Thank you for coming in. And of course, a big shout out to our team who pulled this all together at the last minute. Junaini Johari, Tiffany Ang, Saya Win, Joanne Chan and To Yen Yun. Video editing by Hanida Amin and sound mixing by Ken Delbridge. This is it for Deep Dive. Uh, we'll see you guys real soon. Bye. Bye guys.